welcome to Contour Podcasts. I'm Josh Craker, the CPO of Contour. And I'm Carl Wagner, the CEO. So digitization is undoubtedly the future of trade finance. It has been our mission to transform and digitize trade since Contour launched in 2020. Since then, of course, we all know that a global pandemic has brought and continues to bring widespread disruption amongst other causes. And while many industries have jumped on the digital bandwagon, many trade finance processes are still done manually and with paper. Now, we're lucky at Contour that we are not doing this alone, and there's many partners out there that are helping to drive digitization. Today, we are going to speak with BAFT, uh, a leading global digital industry, or a leading global industry association for international transaction banking. And maybe Todd can tell us a little bit more about BAFT in a minute. So this association released its trade digitalization white paper in June 2022, providing an overview of where things stand, digitization of trade and finance, what the obstacles are, and where the opportunities lie for the banking industry. So we're very pleased to be joined today by Todd Burwell, the president and CEO of BAFT. And he's joining us today from Washington, D.C. Hello, Todd. Hi, Josh. Hi, Carl. Good to see you guys. So really happy to have a conversation with you today about sort of the the state of trade digitization. So maybe we'll start off with you in terms of this word digitization. You know, this is a big uh, catch-all term in trade. You know, can you break this down in terms of what are the different parts of trade that need digitization? And maybe can you tell us a little bit about the goals, like the actual underlying business goals that you think we can achieve uh, through digitization? Yeah, so so this is interesting because you use the word digitization and and the more that i've traveled i heard the word digitalization so it then prompted me to say okay so what's the difference between digitization and digitalization and i think that so that's kind of the first point is that um the way i think about that is that digitization is the process of converting information into digital format. And so when I think of that, I think of things like OCR and ICR. I think of things like e-bills of lading or e-invoices or e-certificates and things like that. Digitalization is really the transformation of processes that will create end-to-end digital transactions or digital interactions. Um, And there, I think about technologies like distributed ledger solutions. I think about, you know, AI or machine learning. I think about APIs and data transfers and, and how organizations use digital documents in their end to end process um, or how they use that data to then do analysis of their processes or of their customers or of their transactions, et cetera. And there you can think about things like how companies are trying to approach issues like fraud or KYC or or customer information management, things of that nature. Now, when we started looking at this this topic more broadly, about five years or so ago, we uh, published a white paper called uh, Code is Not Law. And, At the time, we were really sort of caught up in the wave of the types of technology that was coming out at the time. And I think the conclusion of the white paper is that there's really two major obstacles that we as a community need to try to solve. for, And one of them is interoperability and being able to connect various digital solutions or what you'll hear called digital islands that allow for automation of different parts of the processes or different processes within different sub industries. And that's not just blockchain, but that's really connecting all of these digital islands. And what that really requires is standards um, as a start. Then there was a, a second huge piece of this, which was the legal framework, because in many countries around the world, if you really want to be able to demonstrate ownership or title of of goods as it relates to trade, you need to produce a piece of paper. And so around that same time, I think late 2017, 
Um, UNSATRAL published its model law for electronic transferable records, or what's affectionately known as MELITER. Um, it was adopted in about seven or eight countries. Um, and so there's been a, a huge push to try to drive change in the legal framework in order to allow for data and digital documents to be legally acceptable and legally binding in the context of digital trade. So I think that's that's the way I think about digitization. And I think those are the two huge pieces that we're trying to help solve for as an industry. Okay, so I think that there's a lot we can talk about about what is happening uh, and how uh, the industry is looking to digitize. But I'd like to understand the drivers and, and the why a little bit more. So maybe a question for both of you. So at sort of a, a micro level, like for the actual individual participants in trade, thinking about uh, the corporates who are importing and exporting, the banks who are financing that trade, um, what is driving them you know, to digitize, knowing that it's such a challenge? We'll start with banks. Carl, you want to talk about banks? Sure, sure. I think banks, I mean, banks have been trying to digitize for years and I mean, 20, 30 years ago, some of these projects, did, you know, digitizing was just scanning and sending to somewhere else, right? But I mean, the banks see the benefits of lowering the cost to service customers, right? Which means they can service more customers, smaller ones more efficiently. Um, and that's that's a goal that they're all striving to now, whether that's a competitive edge sometimes or whether that's a collaborative ecosystem benefit that's going to help both sides of a transaction. But banks definitely see that 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 opportunity to to work together and and lower the cost. OK, so lowering costs. How, how about you, Todd? You spend a lot of time speaking with bank members at BAFT. What do you see as really the key driver uh, for them to digitize processes? Because we know it's not easy or cheap for them to go on this journey. Yeah, so I, I, I do agree that the cost is certainly a factor, long term cost in terms of their their operations. Connectivity is another one and and the, the better you're able to digitally connect, the broader your your network can grow. And just think of it in in terms of simple brick and mortar. Um, and as you move to um, less urban centric economies, your ability to connect with clients in more rural areas is is made easier if you can digitize your connectivity to clients. I think another big one in particular over the last few years, although I think it's always been there, and Carl alluded to it earlier, is really risk mitigation, fraud mitigation, and, and those elements. We saw a, a huge spike, I think, in the last you know five to eight years of invoice fraud and other types of fraud that really became costly for um, not only institutions, but I think the industry as a whole, because then regulators looked at the industry with a little bit of suspicion to say, how are you going about trying to manage this fraud? And that actually, was a catalyst in some cases for organizations to prioritize where they were going to invest in digitizing. And I think fraud and risk mitigation became one of those drivers. Okay, well, I think that's very interesting as well. I heard it described once as it's a sustainable path to growth, right? So banks want to grow their business, but they need to make sure that it's sustainable. They have to make sure that their costs are low, that they can manage their risks. You know, even if, as you mentioned, you're going into more uh, areas that are, are harder to reach or more expensive or in, in categories they haven't always had a lot of experience in. How about yep. the other side? Because, of course, banks can can want to digitize trade and trade finance all they want, but they're really just talking about the trade finance piece. They really need the corporates to go along on that journey with them. So maybe back to you, Carl. What do you see as driving corporates, people who are engaging in international trade? What's driving them to digitize? Is it the same thing as a cost or is it something different? Well, no, it, it's you think about it. 20 years ago, you had to travel. You had to use an agent to be able to inspect goods, understand who the customer was, right? You had to travel. You couldn't see their their web page or, or have webcams and see on the internet, right? So communication was a lot tougher. Now we can see all that. Customers are expecting a more digital experience 
and uh, they want to save cost. Instead of having to travel, uh, they 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 want to be you know be able to use use the internet and and access data. So I mean, the corporates want to leverage technology to save costs, potentially get cheaper financing. If the banks can do it, maybe the banks do it cheap, can do it more cheaply because it's more efficient, or because there's less risk, because there's more data data points to analyze, um, or maybe just being efficient allows them to do more transactions with that same existing credit lines. Right, so digitalization is a way of of managing your transactions in a more efficient manner, and uh, you know it can help that that 1.7 or 1.9 trillion you know trade finance gap that's out there. If smaller companies have more access, uh, banks can do it cheaper. Then that's great for the corporates because a lot of corporates are not buying big to big; it's big to small. So you got to be able to service the small side too. Okay, interesting. Todd, anything you want to add to what, what you've seen with corporates and what's driving them to digitize? Are they really pushing the banks on this or what do you see happening? Yeah, so it, it's interesting. I think in pockets, um, the corporates may be leading, but I, in, in, in all honesty, I do think the banks have been pushing in many cases. And what I hear is the corporates sometimes are saying, why, what is that going to give me? But but one thing that's that I think is consistent is the, the, the point around connectivity and access and your ability to engage with a market beyond where you normally might. And I think that that also in in some ways applies to your access to capital uh, because you have potentially um, the ability to bring in providers of capital if they have greater transparency into whom whom they're lending and and interacting with right so so that's a benefit is that a primary driver i think it 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 may vary by company so i think this is a really interesting thread maybe we'll pull on a, a little bit because what we're saying is that the growth and, and the driver for sort of digital trade maybe aren't the companies that are heavy traders today it could be people who are not able to access trade finance today that need a solution and digital might be the only option for them which has lots of potential to drive changes at the macro level so maybe let's talk a little bit about that in terms of uh, back to utah you know you have spoken about how digital trade is the next frontier uh, in economic development universally you know especially in the context of the challenges that the global economy is facing today you know can you elaborate a little bit on why this is and why this is going to make an impact so um, I, I don't want to get a I don't want to get too far over my skis, but we we participate right now in an industry wide um, working group that's made up of, of industry bodies and and banks and multilateral development banks and others that are looking at the issue of financial inclusion in trade, and what we are working towards is trying to produce a roadmap that identifies you know for for public sector stakeholders for private sector and, and everyone in, involved you know what does each party need to do in order to help us close that 1.8 trillion dollar gap right and and so digitization and digitalization is a key part of that um and and the financial inclusion topic is is core um to that if you look at things for example like e-invoicing um that can potentially open up an entire new world of access to capital for small and medium-sized companies and so that's that's just one piece of the puzzle um trying to figure out how to simplify and improve on the kyc and the onboarding process will accelerate um, the ability for companies to to get access to the banks and and to other lenders, and I think it will also increase the appetite that uh, that lenders have for those those companies. Um, you know, the more you can do with analysis to improve your credit scoring models and things like that um, may also help some of those companies that today are not able to to access that capital. So again, I don't want to, you know, get get too deep into it, but those are some of the things that I think we're looking at in tangible ways where this this will improve life. 
Yeah, no, I think it's a, it's a really interesting point, right? And Carl mentioned it before, you know, it may not be the existing trader that necessarily needs digitization. They might need it for a counterparty who right now doesn't have access to trade finance so that they can do more business than they would otherwise. And then we're starting to talk about, you know, a blue ocean, right? We're talking about a bigger pie. Um, but, you know, there's there's still challenges, of course. So, you know, Carl, I, I think you've seen some, some hurdles that are that are still remaining to sort of driving digital ad- adoption. You know, what are these main challenges and sort of where do, do banks and fintechs and, and corporate stand all these key challenges? Yeah, I, I think that, OK, you can't say everyone wants digitization. Everyone wants efficiency. Some people don't like that. They don't like that transparency. Some of the bad players don't like that transparency, but most folks like that efficiency, like that ability to do more business. Now, are they willing to go through that effort of adopting technology? Now, that can be different by industry, different by size of company, different to family-owned company or a public company, um, because even if they want to go forward, there's there's always that first question. This is great. If I can do it for 100% of my transactions and there's one system out there, then I'd be love to start. I'll start, you know, start tomorrow. And again, if there was one, I'm going to wait for one system to be to, to solve it all. Well, trade is very complicated. Not one system is ever going to solve it all. Not even trade finance. But if you think about overall trade and the logistics and all that, there's way too many areas of expertise. But the other thing is, if you're, if they're sometimes waiting for that one perfect system, well, we're, we're, you know, if you're through the pandemic, we used Skype and Teams and Zoom and, and uh, WebEx, right? If everyone said, I'm waiting for one system, I don't want to log into different systems. I'm not going to talk to anyone on video until it's all settled. Well, the last couple of years, no one would have talked to anyone, right? So you have to use the technology that's out there. And I think that's one of the challenges is that, Technology and technology development is a journey. So, Todd, let, let's maybe get you a, a chance to talk a little bit about BAFT. I'm not sure all of our listeners are, are sort of fully aware of who BAFT is and what their role is. Could you maybe talk a little bit about what BAFT is doing in this area of driving adoption of digital trade and why you see this as an, as, as an important thing to focus on and spend some time with us tonight? Sure. So, so we are, as as you said at the outset, an industry association. We were founded in 1921, and with the with the idea of helping our members at the time, it was 10 Midwestern U.S. banks um, improve on how they did international trade. That was the simple mission. Um, in today's terms, our focus is really broader to include transaction banking more widely. Um, we have members in 60, 65 countries, and we also have 25% of our membership are non-bank companies that are in the transaction banking space. So we really do try to serve the ecosystem, not just financial institutions, but others that have solutions that that help um, in that in that sphere. So those are technology companies, those are advisory firms, those are multilateral development organizations and others. And so when we step back and we look at, all right, what are the big common challenges that we can help try to solve for? Because that's really the key for us is, is this a common issue that requires sort of industry-wide intervention or collaboration? Trying to digitize trade is is clearly one of those top opportunities or or top challenges, and so I and I I do want to echo um, what Carl said about uh, you know just sort of getting started right because when I I think about um, our membership we have the largest of the large global banks. Many of them have been investing in technology at levels that are, you know would would make your head spin. Um, so so with them, I think they're already in the water. They're they're trying new things. They're pushing the envelope. And I think our goal and and our challenge and and what we're trying to do there is to help provide the consistency to help provide the standards. And again, this goes back to the point about interoperability and um, the fact that 
Carl said, don't just wait for one system. Well, I agree. I mean, you 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 want to have systems that can talk to each other, that can connect with each other. It's almost like if you were going to try to buy an airline ticket, you don't need to have one airline that services every city in the world. As long as you can get a ticket that will connect, you may use multiple carriers and it will still get you there in relatively seamless fashion. So I think one of the things we're trying to do is to, to help on the standards piece. And um, so as an example with, with uh, distributed ledgers, a, a couple of years ago, we created what we hoped would be a useful standard called the distributed ledger payment commitment. And, and the impetus behind that was to try to address this interoperability question such that if you had one set of uh, users on one distributed ledger platform that wanted to execute a transaction with those on another platform, how could they do it? Well, you needed to have some business standards, you needed to have some, some technical standards, and that's what the DLPC was intended to do. I think in a, in a broader scale, the ICC Digital Standards Initiative was, was really set up to try to tackle that, that project. Another thing we're, we're trying to do to drive adoption, and I go back to the point about interoperability is one issue, the legal framework is another issue. Um, and, and again, we're working in collaboration with other organizations under the ICC, who, who manages what they call the Legal Reform Advisory Board. We participate in that. I want you to think of that as a collection of a couple of dozen organizations that have divided up the world and said, we're going to go champion this idea of changing the legal framework to allow for digital trade. And we're all going to, we're going to become soldiers in this. And so we have been trying to move um, the U.S. market in particular, there's been some great progress made in in places like uh, like the U.K., where you now have um, a bill that's working its way through through Parliament. In the U.S., there were several amendments that were recently passed to the Uniform Commercial Code, which will support uh, electronic negotiable instruments. We now need to push this through the adoption process across all 50 states. But this is happening in countries around the world. And um, I think with the collective power of the organizations trying to work towards this, we will get there. And I think we'll actually get there sooner than I personally thought we would have. All right. Well, that's 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 definitely great to hear. And I think, you know, BAF plays a really important role in, in driving that collaboration. I think collaboration is absolutely key. Uh, I think the view on interoperability maybe has changed a little bit since the early days of blockchain, um, when there were a lot of different blockchain networks that were out there. Uh, has BAF updated this view at all on interoperability, or is this still a key thing that you're pushing with, with the DLPC? So... Um... I think the short answer, yes, interoperability is still a key issue, um, but I do think it also extends well beyond just distributed ledgers. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think this really encompasses technology broadly. And if you can think of um, the way banks built their back office systems, um, you, you had spaghetti code, right? Because you were stitching together a myriad of solutions that were all specially purpose built to solve for a certain type of problem. And I think the same is true in trade, and I don't think that that will change. So it still comes back to the ease with which you can connect to these specialty systems um, across multiple industries and across multiple functional um, bodies, whether it's, you know, corporates or customs and government agencies and banks or or whomever. So with that regard, I don't think our thinking has really changed around um, interoperability. I think we just we need to continue to build the standards that will help connect a lot of these islands. Yeah, no, I think that that's a really good point around standards and connecting because you're right, like no one's going to be able to digitize their whole business by signing up to one solution. They're going to have to plug in 
to all these different things. Carl, maybe you could talk a little bit about uh, what is Contour doing to sort of meet the customer, whether they be a corporate or a bank, where they are. You know, how how can you help them connect to make it easy, make it simple, even if they're say an SME? Yeah, no, a, a couple things. One is the 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 technology side of it. So, for instance, you know, banks have back office systems um, that manage trade, that manage risk, and and Contour, we decided to to work with them and be able to bring our transaction data into those systems, so the bank back office staff don't need to log in. Right, they can log into Contour. They can manage this as part of their their normal transaction process, just to make it easier. So that's one side on the technology side. Um, on the you know for for a bank, for a small SME, the nice thing is the minimum requirement is is internet access. Right, you have to have internet access. You can use a web browser, and you can still get that same experience that a multinational would get with seeing your transaction, seeing the process, and collaboratively managing a transaction with, with your counterparties. So again, making it simple, cheap for, for SMEs. We have an SME uh, model, so because uh, we realize that since Contour manages both sides of the, uh, the uh, letter of credit, so it's the buyer and the seller, it could, either side could be a small, a small company. So we, it's not just a, a bilateral with a bank, it's that whole ecosystem. So we have to have a SME model to allow them to participate as well. And again, everyone, everyone, everyone wins when you have more data to exchange and follow. So Tom, maybe we'll stay on this, this SME topic for a second. Um, in your view, is, is this important to trade finance? You know, SMEs are not always uh, the companies that, that banks want to provide trade finance to historically. Uh, due to the cost or or due to the risk associated. Do you see this changing and what would be the importance of that? So I absolutely think that um, this this challenge with digitizing for the for the purpose of including SMEs is is critical. You know, I mean, I, and and this may vary by country, but I, I remember seeing some statistics from the World Bank that said about 90% of all businesses are, are SMEs or MSMEs. They account for 50% of employment, 40% of GDP. You know, we ignore SMEs at our own peril, right? So the the challenge though, and it's it's perfectly logical. If you think about rolling out new technology and implementing new technology, um, it can be, it's costly, particularly when it's it's first available. So you need sort of the biggest business case. And so that naturally leads to organizations that have the resources, that have the investment capability, et cetera, being the ones that are the early adopters of this. And and SMEs just they they generally may not have the you know the 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 money or the human capital to be able to invest in this. So we have to make sure that solutions can do what they're intended to do, and that's what the early adopters and large institutions do. But then if we want to talk about adoption, we have to make it super simple for SMEs to be able to adopt it. And, and that is where I think a lot of the discussions that, that we're involved in now are headed, which is how do you make it easy for a small company to be onboarded into this solution? Or how do you make it easy for them to make the business decision that I'm going to spend whatever time or money I need to do to adopt this solution? And and I don't think it's so much that, that banks aren't focused on the SME segment. I do think that there's a bit of, um, you know, every bank has to sort of decide where they're most effective and and which client segment they want to be most competitive in and where they can add the most value the oddity of it is that it's often the smaller banks the regional banks the emerging markets banks that are best placed to serve that sme population but they're not the early adopters of this technology so i think we're in a place right now where we're trying to to meet those two and and that goes back to um, you know my comments. If, if if I'm talking to a large bank about 
you know, digitization. It's really look, just focus on standards, right? And and let's not worry about who's aligned with with what um, uh, uh, solution. But if I'm talking to a bank that really hasn't invested yet, it goes back to what Carl said, which is get in the water. Just, you know, you, you, you have to start somewhere and you have to be able to provide some digital um, solutions that will be valuable, not only for your bank, but for your, your, um, your corporate clients. And those include the SMEs and the MSMEs. Yeah, I think this is going to be a really important trend, right, for both those banks that want to join the sort of smaller regional banks and those SME clients. You know, Carl, do you have any maybe stories you can share recently about how some of these banks are treating new technology and, and how do they want to provide uh, these types of services to their clients? Because one of the things with SMEs is there's a lot of them. You know, you can't onboard just five and be done. You know, you have to have sort of a mass process. So, so how are these banks handling that? No, we're looking at opportunities where, again, banks have their portals. They've spent hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars on their portals, and the customer's are already there. But what do they what do they want to do? They want to give their customers a better experience. And those portals can only manage what that bank and that customer, what they talk about, those that 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 bilateral conversation. But by linking with external workflows as uh, so for instance in contour we can actually create a for that bank and, and for that customer a much more robust uh ecosystem of information but what we're doing is we'll sit behind the bank portal so the bank still manages their own customer we're just a service provider for that bank to provide a better transaction experience and that's going to be really the key to scaling with, uh, with with SMEs because the banks have these portals. They have all their SMEs on many of them online already. They've they've encouraged them to be online to to be able to be a customer. So instead of selling individually to everyone, why don't you link to the system, go where the customers are? And I think it's a tremendous opportunity to give more services for that existing customer base and again, delight the customers in a different way. So interoperability uh, sounds great. <laughs> Um, so maybe let's let's go to the last topic today, and, and I think this is the topic that everyone is talking about now, which is uh, sustainability or ESG, uh, which is obviously having a massive impact on how people are looking at global trade and the finance of global trade. Um, how does this sort of intersect with digitization and, and does it at all? Maybe Todd, I'll ask you first. Um, and sort of where do you see this helping, hurting, uh, and, and, and where is it going to go from here? Yeah, so so digitization is one of the two biggest topics that we're engaged in, and sustainability is the other, right? Um, and I think what I consistently hear in, in the consensus is that, particularly in trade, is that really achieving sustainability is not possible without digitalization. It's not possible, right? And that goes from the tracking process to the reporting process to the monitoring process, et cetera. And in many cases now, a lot of organizations, when they actually look to make investments in technology, there may be a primary purpose, which is, you know, fraud risk, or it may be client access or, or whatever that driver is. But I can guarantee you that sustainability is another fundamental reason why they're making that investment in technology. So um, I think, though, it, it, in my opinion, this still comes back to a challenge that I'm concerned about, which is what does this mean for SMEs? Because SMEs are, are not going to have the same tools to be able to um, demonstrate the elements of of sustainability to the same degree and with the same ease that larger companies are. So as we're thinking about um, rolling out these digital solutions again, I think we have to make it right size to where we can include SMEs in that process. OK, um, Carl, well, do you have an opinion on this as well? You know, we're talking about ESG and its intersection with 
technology and digitalization? You think it's a driver? Well, absolutely. I think it, it's part of part of that decision uh, for adopting new technology. You have to have some of these components. ESG and, and sustainability is there, I think. But there's also the component is that you know the banks may want to do it, the corporates may want to do it. First, you have the technology, but also you have to have the reason to do it, right? So are banks going to give a different price for a a a more sustainable transaction, right? Or more I and mean, right now it's more on a company level. And I think it's going to be really powerful when on a transaction level, you can analyze a transaction and see if it hit those those benchmarks for sustainability that that bank is set or maybe an industry is set. But if you could do it by transaction, then it's a, a lot more accurate than than just saying this industry, we check them once a year and, and they're doing their part. Now, I completely agree, Todd, that then you also have to think about the SMEs and do they have, you know, what are those triggers that we need? And maybe they're, they're slightly different for, for SMEs like they are now. But uh, hopefully technology is is cheap enough for them to be able to give um, those updates, those milestones to allow that ESG analysis to happen. Yeah, no, I think that's going to be interesting, right? So if governments start saying that, you know, ESG requirements have to be transactional, not relationship, you know, to your point, Todd, I think you're right. Digitalization is is a must. Uh, it's a prerequisite for that to for that to occur. But ESG is not just environmental, right? There's there's also the social and governance. And talking about SMEs and the trade finance gap, I think that's a big part of it as well. So I think getting it right is is going to be key. But I think it's for sure another driver. So to the last question to you both, uh, with all of these new drivers coming towards us. When are we going to get to uh, the tipping point of trade digitalization? So uh, the tipping point we could define for the purposes of this podcast as the norm uh, being in a digital network uh, where you're connecting your clients to a wider network and not just yourself. Uh, for that to be the norm, when are we talking? Are we talking this year, next year, this decade, next decade? Uh, maybe, uh, Carl, you can go first, you can be brave, and then we'll, we'll let Todd have the last word. I can be brave. I, I think in the next, I mean, we've been trying this for, for 20 years. I've been in this journey for, for over 20 years, digitizing and, and, uh, but the, I think the key changer is the technology is there, right? We couldn't have done this before the internet and that started kicked off some of this this digitalization was the access and the internet now i think some of the new technologies are out there to manage data that fall that manage data and data privacy under the new regulations and 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 uh, that that governments are, are putting in place but i it's not going to be next year um, um i think but probably by industry it could be maybe a five-year horizon, you know, or a 10-year horizon, probably by industry. Absolutely okay. not everyone. What do you think, Todd? You said it was going yeah. faster than you thought. Yeah, I, but I faster than I thought. I still, I think Carl's in, in the right ballpark. I think it is a this decade um, time frame. I think five years, five, seven years is reasonable. And I think that there's there's a few factors, at least in my mind, that, I theorize why that is, right? And so one of them is we're already seeing in certain countries where the government has an outsized role on the way private industry operates, governments are starting to drive this, right? Mm -hmm. And that makes the that makes a difference because if the governments either through the carrot of saying, um, you know, we'll, we'll provide these incentives or through the stick by saying, if you don't do this, there'll be some penalties. Um, they can spur action and activity. And I think we're seeing that in a few cases. Second thing is, um, and, and I'll give you an example. One of the things that we're, we're looking at now is this topic of, of deep tier supply chain finance. And this is something which is is prevalent in certain markets in Asia in a domestic context. But what we have seen is that 
through the use of certain structures and the use of certain technology that um, supply chain finance has been able to reach, you know, 15 levels deep into a supply chain. And the business cases just, they, they write themselves, right? So I think the more that we start to see real examples of success as a function of digitizing, I think that will also increase the, the rate at which we see other organizations adopting it. And then I think the third thing is, is, is just as my hair gets grayer, um, you can be certain that the instincts of our industry get younger, right? And, and so, it, look, I, I, I look at um, my own kids who are, who are both grown adults now. They've grown up. In, in an age of digitization. And their expectations are completely different than why I came into this business. And so those that are starting new companies, and I think younger SME organizations are gonna be much quicker to adopt technological solutions in many cases because their principles, they expect it, they demand it. That's the only way that they think is in a digital context. And so as that naturally um, uh, plays itself out, I think we're going to see an acceleration of this. OK, well, that sounds very hopeful. Well, I think that's all the time we have for this episode. So so thank you very much, Todd, for your fantastic insights. And that was Todd Burwell, the president and CEO at BAFT, and of course, our very own Carl Wegner. Uh, if you're ready to start your own digital trade journey, and as these gentlemen said, get into the pool, uh, please check out our website to learn about Contour. The URL is contour.network. Thank you for listening in. Until next time, I'm Josh Craker, signing off.